Thank you. Our uh, next speaker is uh, David Christie. So, uh, David, you take part one to start when you're ready. Okay. Um, just while the slides are coming up, just like to introduce myself, I guess. Um, I'm from the Hebridean Green Energy Futures Project, which was a consortium of um, members of the Way developers, such as Columbus, Dr. Marine, and various Scottish universities, um, like here by Lewis Castle College. The work here was done by ourselves in Edinburgh. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, just the general process of doing a resource model, in case any of you aren't familiar. Um, our sort of take on it using the Hebrides as a bit of a case study. So um, thank you all for coming. Welcome to Lewis. You've been here a couple of days now. I uh, hope you've been enjoying yourself. Um, the reason why I'm showing, showing the slide to see exactly where we are, right in the northwest of Europe. We've got all this lovely Atlantic fetch here. So we're clearly in a very high energy resource area here, in fact. Um, slightly to the west of Lewis will be St Kilda, so if you've signed up for the trip, you should be glad it's May, or else you'll be staggering off the boat saying what an energetic wave resource they have in Lewis. Um, given that it's such a high resource, here's a bit of um, UK context. Um, it's probably the highest, um, most energetic wave climate in, in Britain. Um, for that reason, there's been, uh, you know, this is just our um, domain map of it, quite coarse resolution, which most a lot of them are, which is, made, I guess that's why we're doing, uh, filling in the gaps with our model. Um, but given the high resource, there's been a great deal of interest with um, device developers, the wave industry. The idea being to have demonstration, uh, demonstration sites of initially single devices of EMEC and then put arrays down in the sort of um, harsher climates of Lewis, um, interconnected notwithstanding. For this reason, there's been a great deal of um, investment in data acquisition. So, um, yes, these are just the wave energy developments. You see, we've got the 10, 10 megawatts of Columbus site somewhere in the red region, and we've got um, somewhere within this blue area will be 40 megawatts of um, oysters. This is going to be the world's largest fully consented um, wave development. Um, for this reason, as I said, there will be a lot of, be a lot of sensors, uh, a lot of data acquired in the area. Coming from a very low base, five years ago there was almost nothing at all known about the area. And since then we've had this lovely high resolution um, Marine Scotland survey done. Um, we've, uh, the Head Marine Consortium have put our own sensors down there. We've had um, the data acquisition led by the Led by, well, led by Arnie, led by the college. Um, we've got the three um, data well wave rider boys out Shadow, Bragger, and Rogue. Here's the timescales of deployment. So we've got a good couple of years worth of data spanning. Um, we've got uh, near show, we've got um, two ADCP type devices um, shown here and that mounted on a frame of, of our own design, really, um, which has been given a quite impressive amount of data given the very harsh wave conditions they're in and 12 meters of water. So given that we've now got all this data, it means that we can really start to produce a nice ground truth validated high resolution spectral wave model for the area. Maybe the first one that's going to be public, publicly available. Um, and here's the area we're interested in. We're most, most interested up here really. This is, you know, we, we extended it here because we could, um, the resolution goes down to 250 meters. Um, for the northwest coast, which is where all the development sites are and where all the centres are for calibration of the model. Um, we're talking 250 uh, kilometres by 75 is about the size of the domain. Um, so for that, for that size of an area, you want to drive it by wind and waves. So we've got these wave spectra. We've chopped the seaward boundary up in 15 sections. Wave spectra coming in um, an early resolution, which is quite, um, quite fine from open ocean and also that's the energy coming in from that and also from the wind which we just got from ECMWF. Um, you've not just that's not the whole story, you've got to transport the energy across, so that's the main reason why you do the modelling. Um, we use Mike 21 which tracks it using um, the conservation of wave action. Um, we've got a nice um, linear equation here that deals with um, deals with your refraction and showing uh, of course. As we mentioned before, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, there's a lot more physics, complicated physics than that going on. We've got white capping, bottom, bottom interactions, wave breaking and things. 
these are all fairly complicated, can be non-linear physical processes, and to get any sort of sense out in the model, they just put in semi-empirical source terms, and the way to make the model useful is you get to calibrate the source terms yourself. So there's, a, there's four free parameters that we have to pick to make the models match up with their observation at the sensors. That's why you need sensor data to get a good model. So we have to calibrate it. So what you do is you just keep changing the parameters around the model. Get your time series out of significant wave height, mean period um, at the sensor locations. And then chop and change them until your model works as well as it can do. Um, the way you can quantify that is you want to minimise the scatter index, which is root mean squared error over the mean, and make sure the bias is um, basically <coughs> one of over predicting or under predicting um, systematically. Um, so, how, how do we actually marry up the sensor data to the model outputs? Well, you've got four different parameters you want to change, you've got five sensors at all. Um, you know, it's, you're not stumbling around multi dimensional parameter space. You want to just separate them nicely. So, what we're doing is two points here, which we use to fix the white capping, because the white capping takes place everywhere. And then, once that's fixed, we look at the shallow water, um, more shallow water phenomena by using ABCP data. We keep one boy data aside for validation so that we know that we've not just forced it to work at the boys we're calibrating to, it's behaving itself everywhere in the model. So look, let's get into the sort of nitty gritty a bit. We've got white capping. Um, the thing about white capping is there's actually two parameters for white capping, one for kind of how much white capping you've got and one for which bit of the spectrum it takes it from. So you actually can't really treat them independently. So what we've been doing is taking a sort of two-dimensional, just going through all the combinations. You've got one parameter across here, one parameter down there, and just generating surfaces. And that's the sort of region where it seems to be working best for wave height and mean period. Once you've got that region, you know that's going to be where your minimum is, because you want to minimise the scatter index. Then you can zoom in and get it in a bit more detail. Um, here's the same thing for bias. You can tell here. Over predicts, under predicts, nice region here where it's you want to keep keep your parameter combinations there so you're not introducing extra energy in. And then, as I said, get the get the get the smaller area and run a bit more um, modeling just to make sure you've fit, fitted your fixed your end um, point precisely. Now you could you don't have to do all the combinations, you could iterate between the two. You can't do them independently, but you kind of Fix one, then fix the other, and um, that's what a lot of people do. Um, show in context what can happen when you do this by showing the whole thing. So, say we fix this as a default value of 0 0.5. So, imagine we fix this and then just run through all the values of this, um, this parameter. Here's our nice little, there's the minimum there. So, we'll fix that, and then there it is. So, we know that that's there, and then just put a check what that parameter's going to be. So, we run across all the values that it can be at find the minimum, which is here, and then stay there and check that. So you keep alternating one to the other, pinning one down, checking the other. And you see that's not moved, it's stable there. So that's going to be where you decide your minimum was, which is a little bit away in parameter space for where you actually it turns out to be if you can go through all the combinations and look for the global one. So you have to be a bit careful. It's just explaining that. Easier, easier stuff with bottom friction and wave breaking because it's, you do sensitivity and you can just treat them independently. Now, interestingly, you can do this, do this surface at one particular time period, and because it depends so much on the wave conditions, you can do it at a different time period and get a different answer completely. So we've got so much seasonal, vari seasonal variability here. I mean, this is a wave height. You think. It's actually more related to energy, so if you're squaring that, it's going to be even worse. Um, so if you're picking one time period, like here, to do your calibration, or you pick here, then you need to be careful. Yep. So you can either run it for the whole year, or um, if you don't have the computational resources, think about using an ensemble of shorter ones, which also, even if you do have the computational resources, if you can cover all your... Um, cover all your C states with an ensemble like this, then you've got a lot more computational power you can use to um, fix your actual parameters with more precision. You're not having to waste time running it for a whole year. Um, all, all this talk of um, ensembles of time and 
you know, two D space means you can have to run hundreds or even thousands of relations this way. But fortunately, with even with Mike Twenty One, it's actually easy to automate. This is what it actually looks like when you're running it, but they're really just text files, so you can generate them yourself. Um, use, if you write the software for it, get it to run the models for you, um, get it to post process for you. Um, you know, if, this, if you're doing a lot of these, it's worth sitting down and writing loads of software, so it just does it automatically. Having done this, um, we calibrated as best we could, and <coughs> now we get to actually run the model properly and validate. So we've calibrated these two boys, um, although not for the whole year, we've just chosen this little ensemble. So we've still got this little bits in the middle to fill in, check it's still working, and we've got this rogue boy for validation. So here's what it looks like. The results, so there's a rogue boy there. Um, this is all our um, scatter index and bias. So that's relatively respectable, I would, I would argue. Um, here's a sort of plot of the measured against um, Modeled. So if we um, if we measured a three meter significant wave height for an hour, and the model said it's going to be nine meters, then there'd be a point up there. So you want all your points to be kind of along that line, and they they are to some extent. I think that's okay. Great. So here's a time series. This shows you we've got the results of the model in red and the results of the measurement in blue, you see very, very slightly the model's under predicting, but it's tracking it pretty well. I um, don't know what happened there, but that's quite interesting to look into in more detail. And even it seems to get the period quite, quite, quite accurately as well. Um, at the other two boys, where, these are where we did calibrate, so you can expect the results to be even better. Um, we've got very small, small biases, nice scatter index. Here's your scatter plots again. I'll just cycle through these quite quickly because they're just showing the same thing, really. Um, these are time series, and it does track it very closely again. Um, that bit there is just where the boy didn't bring any data back. Um, and this is the whole year. We've run the model now um, pretty much till December. And it's just finishing off. Again, the shadow boy. Um, got very, very low biases here. Five centimetres under, under prediction over the year. Um, and here's your scatter plot, and it's all looks like it's along the line. And here's the tracking again, model to the measured ones. Even in, you know, it seems to sort of track it even for high, high energy steam as well as the normal stuff you get. Uh, here's the AWAX. And I've separated it out because you get, you get two different prices, one with the AWAX, and the way you get, you've got a pressure sensor and you've got a velocity ones. So I kind of almost did two. Um, you see here, it's the green was the velocity and the blue was the pressure. Um, slightly different shape, only very slightly for the scatter diagram here. Um, and here's the two, well, the three time series. And you know these AWACs are only in 12 meters water, so it's they're almost validating each other in a way. They sort of get quite nice, um, even for the very energetic ones. They seem to sort of track each other quite well. Uh, and finally, way down at the sea fast boy. Um, we only got up till May because it was just post recovery. But here's we didn't even attempt to calibrate the model here. But here's what the how it performs. So if you want to know, if you want to use it for the areas down here, this is kind of how accurate your model's going to be. Um, and again, the time series. Uh, and I'll just finish off by showing the, some of the data we generated. Um, so we've been generating area plots of. I can see it. That's it. So here's the. It's changed in for significant wave height, and we've got the arrows here for power, um, power flux. These are the sort of outputs that we will be providing if anyone wants them. It's you know we'll be doing seasonal and um, annual averages as well. We'll have the wave height, um, period, direction, spread, um, power, and all the rest of it. You could use it as a to baseline data, if you want to look at the effect of wave energy converters, you can also use it to drive uh, sediment models and things like that, if you wish. Um, and as I said, it's the first high resolution one. I hope to allow time for questions. I'm not sure if I have. Great, because it's the sort of thing everyone wants to share their own modeling tips and imagine. Thank you very much.
um, we basically just made sure that the ensemble was large enough so that within the precision of um, your calibration matrix, the results were stable. So I chose, I ended up taking an ensemble off, I think it was about 46 days, and then I would take, keep taking random subsets of it and seeing if it changed at all. And if it didn't, then I fi figured that the ensemble was large enough. If it had still been even slightly moving, um, you know, by, you know, more than the sort of granularity of the parameter space, then I'd have kept taking more. So by increasing the number of subperiods in the one year, you reach some kind of equilibrium position? Yes. Okay. So, well, like, so and it, it, the actual position of equilibrium may vary from model to model, but you kind of, you know when you've reached it, really. Yeah.